to kick things off this final session, um, I'd like to introduce Murray Hill. He's the Chief Executive of Elevate Uranium and he's talking about his projects in Australia and Namibia. Please welcome Murray. Thank you, Chris. Uh, good to be here, but not necessarily, as you say, the second last session on a, feels like a Friday afternoon, but maybe it's not. Um, Elevate Uranium, as the name suggests, we're in the uranium business and we're pretty proud of that fact. And what an exciting time to be in uranium. We're talking about the world going decarbonisation, electrification route. Decarbonisation is generating electricity with no, with no carbon emissions. Electrification is electric vehicles. They need power to come from somewhere. Where does it come from? So we need a reliable, clean, carbon-free baseload energy to feed both of these electrification and decarbonisation, and nuclear power is it, right? And then when you look at the math around the supply demand, we, we don't, currently don't supply enough uranium to meet the demand of the nuclear fleet we've got around the world, the 437 nuclear reactors. So now we've got reactors being built and reactors being planned, and we're not increasing our supply. So the only way to increase supply is for the underlying commodity price to rise. Um, and the uranium price is currently moving. We're up to $65 a pound or so. Uh, but with inflation, all those companies that were going to come on production at $65 a pound, inflation's hit us and it's probably now 75 or more. So we need the uranium price to continue to go north. Uh, we're expecting it to go a lot further north than it currently is. And those two things we talked about, nuclear, uranium supply demand, are two things we can't control, but they influence our stock price uh, and our outcome. What we can control is what we do as a company. We are proud to be in the uranium industry. Uh, we've been in it for 16 years. We're not distracted by any other commodity. We've got assets and resources in Namibia. We've got four discoveries in the last four years and exploration programs in Namibia. We've also got resources in Australia. And we've got this thing called Upgrade. It's a up process we developed in-house uh, and it lowers the cost base for processing these shallow style of ores. We've got a small team. And as I said before, what better time to be in the uranium industry? We, it's getting very exciting around the world, uh, the way we're talking about the use of nuclear in the future, uh, and hence the supply we need of uranium. So let's talk about Namibia first. Uh, we are geographically diverse, as, as Chris said, we're in Namibia and Australia. Namibia is uh, where we've got a lot of uh, effort being put into exploration at the moment. Uh, it's a fantastic jurisdiction to be in. Uh, it's an African country, people tend to put Africa in a basket, but. Namibia uh, is, is a really good spot to be. Family have been there on holidays, absolutely loved it. Um, people are good quality people. Uh, we've got four geos working for us over there. Uh, excellent people. So it's, a, it's, a, it's a, the only country in the world with a dedicated uranium association. That uranium association is a conduit between government, stakeholders, shareholders, and uh, companies like us, exploration, uh, developers and producers. They do a fantastic job of promoting the industry. Now, Rossing Uranium Mine, sitting in the middle of this map, have been in operation continuously since 1976. That's 47 years of continuous operation. I think that's the longest running continuous uranium mine in the world. So subsequently, there's two generations of culture that are used to uranium mining and processing in Namibia. So it's not a fight for us to get anything in production. And recently we've had you know, um, HUSAB come into production about half a dozen years ago. So it's not, we're not fighting uh, greenies or anything. We are, we are very much, under, they are very much understanding of, of nuclear and, and uranium processing. So down the bottom of this map, we've got the Nami barrier. Um, that's where we've got a contiguous land position we build up. And the reason we picked this area is because we're chasing paleo channels, which are old river systems, where the uranium's leached out of the granites over millions of years of weathering and flow down these river, river systems and precipitate when the geological conditions are right. Been covered up subsequently and we're having to find them. So we've gone upstream of known deposits. So there's plus 270 million pound in this area. So we've targeted areas where we think are uh, prospective. The first tenement we got uh, granted back in 2018, uh, 2019, sorry, after applying for it in 2018, was the copies one in the middle of this map. But in, and in the interest of time, I'm not going to talk about all our projects in Namibia. We do have the largest land position for nuclear fuels in the country. So let's just focus on copies. Uh, in the first three years of tenure, our first period of tenure, we, put, we um, estimated a resource of 20 million pounds. So subsequent to that, 
we've done some extra drilling and we've established that the strike length of this deposit is now 20 kilometres long uh, and we're drilling that out. So as you can imagine, we're drilling 20 kilometres takes a very long time. We're drilling 100 metre by 100 metre grid. Uh, so it's 20 kilometres from one end to the other. That's 200 holes just to get from one end to the other, let alone going east-west. So what we are focused on is, is getting, uh, expanding this resource and to do so, we'd, we've got three drill rigs working there. Each drill rig drills five holes per day. Each hole is 25 metres deep, vertical RC holes. Each hole costs us about a thousand Australian dollars to drill. So with three rigs drilling Monday morning to Friday afternoon, going back into Swakop Mon for the weekend, they're drilling 75 holes per week. I don't think you'll ever have anybody stand in front of you at any stage and tell you that each drill rig can drill five holes per day. Uh, here of many other uranium producers drilling one hole every couple of weeks. So we really are getting over some ground, but we do have a lot of ground to get over. So we're looking at um, expanding this resource um, over the coming months uh, with an announcement and probably in Q1 next year uh, where we can uh, talk about uh, how many more pounds we've got there. So the central Orongo area is an area where up until 2008 and we had one project, the Maranika project on this map, it's got a 61 million pound resource on it. Um, we do believe there's a lot of exploration potential on the tenement, so we're going to drill that next year. Uh, we've gone and found a, a late, one of our discoveries is a Capri project. We've got 16 kilometres of mineralisation there that we now need to follow up. So once the drill rigs are finished uh, resource drilling at, um, at uh, Copies, they'll start to spread. One rig will stay at Copies because there's always going to be more holes to drill because we're finding breakouts of mineralisation on that. Uh, one will probably move down the Namib area and possibly another one up here. So we've got a lot of um, a land to cover, uh, but as I said before, we can drill a lot of holes in a short period of time. So we're focused on exploration in Namibia. Its blue sky potential is enormous. We're having success there, so we'll continue uh, to drill in and explore in Namibia. Moving across to Australia, we've got uh, Australian assets we picked up in December 2019. If you all remember what happened about four months later, uh, we couldn't travel uh, and hence we couldn't do anything with these assets. So we've, uh, we've got the Angela, the, we've got 400 percent owned project. The Angela project uh, is 31 million pound at 1300 ppm just south of Alice Springs. Good sized project. Thatcher Soak in WA, Uber Goomer up in WA, uh, up the top. And I just spoke to someone the, just a while ago who discovered Minerva in, uh, in uh, and he told me the naming but I'm not actually going to repeat what he said to me. Um, and why he named it Minerva, uh, but it's an interesting story, but not for um, not to be recorded, I don't think. So it's um, they're the four projects we've got. We've got a bit of work to do on those. Uh, what we've done once we could move uh, within the Northern Territory from WA, uh, we did some geochem geotechnic technical work on these, and we've just and we've determined a drill uh, program. So hopefully next year we can hit that drill program and see where we can expand uh, Angela and also understand the mineralisation at Minerva. Minerva's got 10 drill holes that exceeded 10,000 ppm intervals, so it's got a lot of promise uh, and we do need to do a bit of work to understand that. We've also got a few other joint venture interests with a joint venture partner uh, around or near the Minerva project. A question that gets asked to me a lot is their upgrade process. Um, it's a process we developed on the Maranika project when we only had the Maranika project before we started to build our, our uh, company up through land acquisition. It's a process we developed in-house with the consultants of CSIRO in Perth. It's what it does is we look at the minerals present in the ores and, and what we do is we determine their associations and their properties. And what we end up doing is we're rejecting the gang minerals on the way through the process. So we're not upgrading uranium initially. The last stage is where we upgrade the uranium. The rest of the time we're focusing on rejecting these gang minerals. So that's the key, that's the innovativeness of it and that's what makes it patentable. We've got three patents around the world. Um, and what, what we do is we reject 95% or more of the mass. So hence you're left with less than 5% of the mass of high grade concentrate that you can take somewhere else or you can leach yourself. So we've got optionality as to where we process that concentrate, uh, which makes a big difference to how we can uh, develop these projects in Namibia. So the examples of what we've done, we've taken the, the Maranika ore from roughly 100 ppm to 5,000 ppm prior to leaching. And the Angela ore in, in Northern Territory, it's got an acid leach problem, or acid problem, I should say, consumption problem. With a small number of tests, we've managed to reject over 80% of 
the calcite, which consumes acid, and hence reduce the acid consumption by 80%. So that needs to be optimised. But certainly there are a couple of examples of what Upgrade can do. Uh, it, it's, it is really a groundbreaking process for us. It's got enormous benefits. Not only does it reduce the capex and opex by 50%, but it gives us that optionality I talked about. Whether you can process, you can leach and refine on site uh, and to produce yellow cake yourself, or you can take it off site. And somewhere like Namibia, Rossing have been there for 47 years, excess capacity in their leach refinery, so they're a candidate to take our concentrate too. So that's an important part of us. So we can develop projects that others can't and we've got a process that no one else has. It's got an enormous amount of environmental benefits, as you can imagine, reducing the amount of material to be leached, uh, reducing the acid consumption, uh, you know, maybe using someone else's tailing stand, leach circuit, the list goes on. So from a corporate point of view, we have the smallest board possible. We've got three directors on one of them. We have two executives on one of them. So we don't waste money on executive teams. We don't have a big executive team. We put money into the ground on expiration, which is what shareholders want. We want to add value to shareholders. We're currently in, sitting in a pretty good position with 10 million cash in hand at the end of June. Uh, we're burning about 700,000 a month. So we've got, as you can do your maths pretty quickly, you can work out we've got a bit of money to keep us going for a while. Um, and with the uranium price going, what it has uh, recently, our share price has gone from 29, 30 cents to 50 cents. Uh, so we're looking pretty good in that respect, but got a lot of more growth to go yet. So, in summary, uranium focused. Only uranium com only company on the ASX with uranium in our name. So very proud of that fact. Not distracted by any other commodity. Been in the business for 16 years. We've got resources in Namibia. We've got four discoveries in Namibia in the last four years. We've got resources in Australia. We've got Upgrade, which is a, a groundbreaking technology for us. Uh, we've got a good small team. And what better time to be in the uranium industry? I don't think you could pick a much better time to be in it than, than now. I'd like to finish on this slide because this is the copies project. So years ago, I used to get asked, can you drill all year? Yes, we can. Do you have to clear much vegetation? No, we don't. And uh, one person new to the company said, oh, is it safe out there? Do you get, I mean, are there lions and leopards? And well, no, there's not. Uh, there's not much out there at all. So it is, it is pretty easy to um, plan your drill programs, but it is a desert. Desert holds its history. We do rehabilitate every hole that we drill, and we're very mindful of, of only using tracks uh, and not going off our tracks. So we respect the desert, we respect the, um, the national park that we're in. And I think we're in a very good position as a company to grow, and I'm very excited about being at the helm of a company such as this as the uranium price continues to uh, in, move north, and we continue to add resources to our uh, portfolio. So thanks for the people that did listen, and uh, appreciate your, your time. Questions for Murray? <clears throat> Murray, do you have a, a view on a possible cancellation of the no uranium policy in terms of nuclear generation in Australia? I think it's an absolute no brainer that it has to change. We've just signed the AUKUS agreement, which is nuclear submarines. If we can't service the submarines here, what's the point of having them? Um, small modular reactors are going to play a huge part in the future. Um, when you look at renewables, they, they take up a lot of land and you've got to build a new grid to them. Whereas if you replace the coal-fired power station with an SMR, small modular reactor, you use the same grid. I've talked to a few other CEOs of, you know, imagine if you had a, a, a copper project in the middle of Australia. And you're, and you're doing your electro winning with diesel generators, costing you 30 plus cents a kilowatt hour. Go and put an SMR out there at five, six cents a kilowatt hour. Imagine the value add we could do, right? So it'll open projects up, right, in the mining industry. It'll open towns up. Having, being a country boy myself, you know, at the end of a power line, it, power's not always there. So, you know, if we could have SMRs around Australia, it would make a huge difference to a lot of things we do, not just mining, but, you know, personal lives and living in different areas. So I think it really has to, but I mean, the minister come out, energy minister come out last night or yesterday and made a comment that it was going to cost what, $380 billion to, to build a, a nuclear project in Australia. But you know, it's been questioned saying it's 16, 18 times more than their estimates. So he's come up with a ridiculous number. 
but he's talked about replacing everything. Whereas nuclear is part of the energy mix. It's not the answer, it's part of the energy mix. And that's where I think we differentiate ourselves from other, other energy providers. Renewables think they're the only answer, but it's a mix, right? And I think nuclear will play a very important role. But the fact the minister's come out and said, it's now down to costs, I think he's gonna lose that argument because costs over 80 years that a nuclear reactor lasts, you know, that's a, a pretty low per year cost for capital. So yeah, I think, it's, I think it's gotta change, but we do things very slowly here, as you know. Murray, uh, I think uh, over the years when the spot price was around $30 a pound, uh, uh, you were saying it's not high enough. Today, you're saying the price has doubled, but it's still not high enough. Uh, what price makes sense for you to uh, get into production? We were, um, we were building our asset base and it was 18 bucks a pound, yeah, so, and absolutely. Uh, when a lot of our peers come out, we've never set a price, deliberately never set a price. Um, you want to draw a line in the sand. But our peers come out a few years back and said we need 65 bucks a pound to get into production. Hit, price hit 64, no one moved. Inflation's hit us, that 64 is, 65 is probably now 75 or more. Um, I think it's gonna take 80 bucks a pound for people to get into production, uh, purely because of what's happened over the last three years around the world. Everything's more expensive. Right? Traveling to projects is double what it used to be. Um, equipment's cost, costing a lot. So I believe the uranium price is gonna sit above 100 for an extended period of time, and well above 100 for a period. So that's going to incentivise nearly everybody to get into production then. But it, it, the price to get into production has increased, unfortunately, because the, purely just because of inflation. But yeah, I'm not going to put a line in the sand for us. Uh, we'll talk about it internally once, because at the moment we're trying to build a resource base because our value is, is based on pounds in the ground. So we're building a resource base. Once the price gets to a number that we like, we'll then start to move on one of our projects. We'll work out which one's our favourite project and we'll start to move down the study path and towards development. But, um, you know, it depends on wh which time of the year you pick is what price you pick, because inflation continues to rise, will continue to be um, impacting on costs. So, yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens with time and then work it out from there. I hope that answers your question. Thanks, Murray. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.